Ah, cool, we're at summary. So let's work out some numbers because we've been talking about, about it for a while. Practical demonstration. Now, a preamble about this. <clears throat> I dare say cash flow statements are not worked out like this, and they're not, because we're going to be doing it old school with T accounts. Having talked to the Institute, and if you're going to go off and do one of the professional qualifications, I'd imagine the CPA is much the same. But when you go do the CA program, you come across financial, the financial reporting module, which is basically us and ABC all wrapped into one, done in 12 weeks. Um, so you will see this sort of material again. They do it this way too. Now, there are obviously other ways. You can do it with a computer. Now, the issue for doing it with a computer is we are not in a situation where we have computers in exam centers at, the mo at this point in time. So there's just no way for us to examine it. So it is done old school. The second reason why it is good to do it this way is it helps, I suppose, open up the hood and get into kind of the engine. Like you actually get to see how this stuff feeds together and how everything links. It works better that way to get a sense of how things move around. If you just do it through computer with, or if you do it through formula, which I know the textbook does as well, one, you've got to remember a whole heap of formula, and if you get a plus and a minus sign around the wrong way, you're screwed. Um, using T accounts, as I've mentioned, I like things graphical. It's not to say you can't use formula. If, you, if it works that way for you, go for your life. Me, I like drawing things, sheep, badly. Um, but it fits, it actually fits and I think works quite well. So let's have a look at what we've got to do here. First thing, check which way, I mean, generally they're around the same way, but check, check which years you're looking at. So in this case, this is the second year and this is the year that we're dealing with. So we've got a whole load of information about assets, liabilities, equity. We have some additional information about property, plant and equipment, net profit after tax, dividends, income tax, sales, sales and admin expense, interest expense, cost of goods sold, and total sales. Now, generally speaking, generally speaking, that could also be provided in a profit and loss statement. So you may see it set up differently to what you see it here, but you're still looking for the same information. So don't get thrown. I can't even remember if there was a practical question on cash in the exam, um, or even if there is a question on cash. But don't get thrown if this is presented differently. Look for the information that you need and then go from there. So we've got some working to do, but before we get to that, this is ultimately what we're going to end up with. Now the nice thing is, if you take in a copy of the standards into the exam, you don't have to remember how this is laid out because if you go to the, if you go to the appendix of 107, there was actually an example of what a cash flow statement looks like. So in terms of all those items, you can actually just see it and know what goes where. So you don't need to remember that. What is of interest is how we come up with all of these numbers. And that, it, this is just a problem solving exercise. And that's what we're going to do now. So if we're looking for cash flows from operations, let's start with receipts from customers. We'll see that. So that's the number that we want. We obviously don't have it yet. You wouldn't have this in an exam, kind of defeat the purpose. We need some information. And we need some T accounts. See that? Sales, accounts receivable. Is there anything else going on that we need? I don't think so. Okay. So let's imagine point eight 
you've got sales total 301,330. You don't have to have sold all, some of those may have been cash, some of those may have been accounts receivable, they may have all been in cash, they may have all been in accounts receivable. Um, just looking at that one line, we can't tell from that. It's probably unlikely that that is the cash flow that happened. When you have sales occur, let's assume, because it just simplifies everything, let's assume all of those sales were on account. So we would, normally if it was cash, it would debit cash credit sales revenue, but in this case, we're going to debit accounts receivable and credit and credit sales revenue. Oh. <laughs> Should have thought about this. I'm going to have to just make a quick alteration. I'm sorry if I've screwed everyone up a bit because we have a starting and an ending balance. Too much, thinking, too much watching the origin and not, not, not enough thinking about what I'm going to do today. So start this again. We still need that 301, but we need a number in here first. So we start with 72. Apologies for all the crossing out that's just happened. 72. Accounts receivable. So if you go to the balance sheet, you'll see that number started there. And accounts receivable ended at 106. So if you see an increase in accounts receivable, that tells you you have not collected everything. It tells you not everything that got sold today or sold this year was collected. We add in the 301330. If we left it at that, let's assume we collected absolutely nothing at all. If we collected absolutely nothing at all, our account receivable closing balance should be about 370 something. You can see just adding the opening plus what's come in. Obviously, that is not the closing balance. And verify these numbers. I might actually use a calculator just, just to double check everything. And this is one of those moments where, you, God, you hope it's been worked out properly. So 72, 230 plus 3, 301, 330 minus 106, 860. Ah, oh, would you fancy that? 266, 700. Now cash, I'm not going to make the same mistake with accounts receivable. We started at 100. And we have just added, because the collection would look something like this. 266700. Now, that's a relatively simple situation with accounts receivable, because you may well have, you may well have um, bad debts coming into play. So you may well have an allowance, for bad, uh, an allowance of bad debts that you need to worry about. You may have bad debts written off. Um, that's not happened in this situation, so we don't need to worry about it. But when you're starting to look through some of the work, be aware of how that affects what's just happened there. So that is dealing with... So we've done that. This next one is probably the toughest section of all of it. So we're moving to payments to suppliers. Now, with payments to suppliers, we're going to be looking at accounts payable. So let's throw in accounts payable, and we start with 87,800, sorry, 87,810, and we end with 103,690. Cool, you can see that. 
So we started with 87, 810, we ended up with 103, 690. Now, there's things that have got to go in there. The first of which is dealing with, we're just going to sort of, we're going to argue that wage sales and admin expense can get thrown in this point. Um, Yes, you could argue that that could be wages payable, but to the extent that there actually was a wages payable of zero to start with and a zero to end with, because you don't actually see it anywhere, um, it just serves our, serves our purpose to put it in here. So we're going to combine kind of all the pay, all the suppliers, so that whether they be staff, whether they be inventory suppliers, whether they be just you know anything else that we paid for gets included here, and that sales and admin expense. So we debit the expense, what is it, 47,630. And, okay. So we've debited sales and admin expense and credited accounts payable. The next thing that's happened is we have cost of goods sold. Now the thing is, cost of goods sold is not what you paid the suppliers for that inventory. It's not even necessarily what you purchased this year. Cost of goods sold is how much you used this year. What we're interested in how much you purchased this year. So we need two additional accounts. So inventory starts at 90 and ends up at 95. Cost of goods sold for the year was 50,000. So we debit. We would debit cost of goods sold and we would credit inventory. Just checking. So what you end up with, if you remember John, actually, you guys, John Tyler, you guys had him for accounting, eh? Or accounting for business? No? Who's John? Yes, you do have John. Did he talk about his cookie jar? There we go. Cookie jar. Um, so we started with a certain amount in the cookie jar. We took a certain amount out. If we hadn't added anything more to that cookie jar, we should have ended up with $40,000 of inventory sitting there. We actually ended up with 55. Sorry, we actually ended up with 95, which means we have purchased... 55, so that's the purchase. And let's say all of that was on account. That has come in to inventory, and let's again assume that it wasn't, none of it was paid in cash up front, we put it, push it all through accounts payable. That goes into 55. Again, the sort of moment of truth where oh, I just hope I've added everything up correctly. So if we have the 87,810 plus the 47,630 and the 55,000, we should have had a closing balance on accounts payable of around about $190,000. So if we just add these three, it should be about 190, and you can kind of see that. We've ended up with 103, which means we have repaid some of those people. We take the difference, 690, and that difference numbered dyslexic right there. That difference is 86,750. which is your 86,750, so that is a cash outflow because we have paid back some of our suppliers. And I'll give you a moment. So you can see we've incurred costs of about 100 or so tad over 100, but because the account payable has grown, we can tell we haven't actually paid off all of that 100. So whether or not it's paying off some of that 100 or not paying off, we paid off all of that and some of this, doesn't really matter for us. What we know is we have only paid 86,750 in terms of 
payments to suppliers. So when we come down here, yeah, we got that right. This is a nice place to be. The good thing about the cash flow statement is you can, if you, if you get a full one, you can absolutely tell if you're wrong because it'll not balance. Doesn't necessarily mean you're correct because you might've just made two equal errors somewhere and it's screwed everything up. But the next 